Hello friends and thank you for joining us. In this session, we will go over Entity Framework. As always, this will be an introduction to Entity Framework or EF for short. So we'll begin with what Entity Framework is and its objects like DB Context, DB Set, and others. Our examples will start with working with SQL Server, but EF does have other providers, for example, uh, SQLite, and we'll get to see how to work with that as well. Um, we'll also go over how to manage your schema um, using EF tools. So all that said, let's get started. So the first thing we want to do is set up our environment before we get started. Here I'm using Visual Studio 2002 with .NET 6. So it's going to look a little bit different because we don't have the main anymore. Um, but um, everything should work like before uh, by creating classes and calling those classes. So because we're working with SQL Server, you can install SQL Server um, and that would be a pretty big step if you're new and you don't know very much about SQL Server. Uh, the other thing you could do is actually go and get a um, Docker container from uh, Docker and it'll have a SQL Server uh, already installed. So here I have my Docker container and I have my SQL Server and I can either launch it and then uh, use my management tools uh, to access the SQL Server. Another way to do it is to actually come into your Visual Studio, right click on your project and add, go to new item. And once this stuff is loaded, then select data. In here, select service-based database. So then you can name your database anything you want and click add. When you do this, you're going to get two files, the database MDF and you get the database log uh, LDF. And to access this, so you can create tables and interact with it, so go to view and select server explorer. Um, here you'll notice that we have the database connection and we can just go ahead connect to a database. In this dialog, um, you can choose the SQL Server, ODBC, Access, Oracle, or something else. Here, because this is file-based, we'll go ahead and select the SQL Server database file. Um, it will only give you one option for the .NET provider. And click Continue. And in here, we're going to point to our database file. which is over here, and click OK. This is going to connect to the database file, and if you open this, you have access to your tables, your views, store procedures, and everything else. Now, we don't have anything uh, as far as tables created, but if you right-click and say Add New Table, then you'll get the familiar um, design uh, window where you can actually either work with SQL, uh, creating your fields, or once this is loaded, um, you'll have the UI where you can select the uh, columns that you wanted to add. So if we just go ahead and create this um, really simple table, the next thing you want to do is click Update. This will actually take the SQL script that you do have, and it'll prepare it, and then it will apply it to the database file. So now we're going to go ahead. It's been already set up, um, the actual table name. Let's go ahead and change the table name to something else. We'll call it table one. The reason we want to change the table name is that the uh, word table is a keyword. And every time you access it, you have to open bracket, close bracket, so you can't really access it the normal way. Now let's go ahead and do the update. Now that everything is prepared for us, uh, we'll click uh, Update Database. Um, if you notice here, um, it is performing some uh, actions, and once it turns green, it'll succeed. This is from our previous where we canceled it. So now if we refresh, we can see that our table is created. You can then right-click on this, um, open the table definition, which will open this design. Or you can actually open to get the columns that you can actually now insert data in here. So now this value is persisted. So if we close this and open it again, you'll notice that we have our data in here. And if you wanted to see how to access this through uh, edio.net or some other means, especially here we're going to use EF, 
if you select the database, um, you'll notice that we have a connection string, um, and that connection string is going to be what will be used uh, throughout uh, for our examples. Now, of course, there's pros and cons of this. Because this is file-based, you won't be able to do a, a couple of things, like uh, if you're going debugging or anything like that, you won't be able to uh, attach and do profiling. Whereas in, if you had a SQL Server or the Docker container, which has a SQL Server service running, uh, you'll be able to attach and do uh, profiling and see what is going on. So this is a couple of ways you could do this. Um, now that we have uh, our preferences set up here, we'll go ahead and do the examples. Now that we have our environment set up, you go ahead and decide which way you want to connect. Now, starting off, um, we'll connect using the database um, file like we have here. But later on in the examples where we show you how to do debugging, um, then we'll go ahead and use the Docker container that has a SQL Server so you can do profiling. So the next thing we need to do is actually bring the EF core assemblies so we can access our data. Now, before we do that, let's kind of go over the documentation at the Microsoft website. And you'll notice that there is Entity Framework Core and then there's Entity Framework 6. So if we go to the EF Core and EF6 to compare the differences between the two, um, you'll notice that the EF6 is uh, no longer being actively developed. So you really should be started uh, coding using EF Core. And in this uh, tutorial and session, we're going to use EF Core. Now, if you head back to uh, Visual Studio and we go to our dependencies, um, we can actually add a NuGet package. So we'll go ahead to the NuGet package manager. Uh, you want to click Browse, and then we want to type Entity Framework. So this is the Entity uh, Framework core that we want to install. Select that and click Install. So now it's going to go get the Entity Framework. It's also going to come in and get the dependencies and install those as well. Click OK, accept the terms. So now that we've installed our NuGet package, if we go over to our uh, EF bench, um, you'll notice that we have the Entity Framework core installed. Now, really, really quick and simple, what we can do is go back to our SQL, and let's go ahead and show data, and then add maybe uh, one more record in here. And now we're going to go ahead and write code to be able to read this data. So that way we can get an understanding of what uh, EF is doing for us. And then we can do a comparison between um, ADO.NET and how that gets data from our database. So the first thing we want to do is we want to create a class. And let's go ahead and call this our uh, database one context and then we're going to go ahead and create one more class and in this one we're going to name it exactly the same as our table table one and let's go ahead and make these public for now the next thing we want to do is table one we're going to actually grab all of the columns that it has so we have a id of int so what we can do is create a property and call it ID. And then the next property we want is going to be a string, and it's going to be data. On the DB context, what we want to do is we wanted to go ahead and use a using statement, and this is going to have our Microsoft dot entity framework core reference and then what we can do is overwrite one method to set our configuration and we'll come back and explain uh, what we're doing here and then in the option builder we're going to tell it that we're going to use SQL Server. 
and then in here we would pass our connection string. Now, a couple of things is happening is that um, we are not able to access our SQL Server, and the reason for that is because we need to reference another package. So let's go back to our Tools, Package Manager, make sure we have Browse selected, and then in here um, we're going to use we're going to use the Microsoft .entity framework core .sql, which is the SQL Server here. Select that, click Install. Once installed, let's make sure we spell this correctly. Actually, we have that over here, so I was using it incorrectly. And then we need to pass a connection string, which is going to be over here. Let's copy that. Bring it over here. And then pass this. So this should set our connection string. So now this has given us an error that is not suitable. And the reason for that is that we need to inherit from DB context. Once we inherit from that class, we can and overwrite the method over there. So the next thing we need to do is we need to have a uh, another property. And in this property, we're going to be using what's called the DB set. And then the DB set is going to be our table one. And let's call this table one. So now let's go ahead back to our program. Let's save everything. And inside of this, what we're going to do is first create our database. Now, in order to use our database context, we need to have the namespace. So we can come up here and say using EF bench. Once we do that, we're no longer going to require the namespace. So now that we have the DB context, all we have to do is select our table and get a to list. We're not going to iterate for this right now. We'll just call this table one. And now we're ready to iterate through this and then do and output the data. So we're going to use string interpolation. Now let's go ahead and run our program. And of course we have errors. And we have errors because we did not escape our string. Make sure that we got rid of all the errors, which we did. Let's go ahead and run our program now. And now you can see that we have our data outputted. Now this was much easier than using ADO.net where you would have to then create a connection or have maybe call a store procedure or do a select statement, get the data reader, put the reader into an object, and then get a data um, presented so that you could iterate through it. Uh, basically, what we did here was very simple. All we did was pass the connection string and then told it to use SQL Server using our connection string. And then all we had was this property of table one when in our program, when we created our class so that we can access that property, we were able to retrieve the data. And Entity Framework makes it a little bit easier for us to access that data. And as you can see, it was very simple to do that. So now let's go over a little bit of what the entity framework is, um, now that you've seen an example of how it works. So what is entity framework? As the name applies, and as we mentioned before, it is a framework that allows easier access to your database. So EF maps your uh, objects that you have in your database, your tables, to the objects in your code. So basically having this DB context uh, is binding us to a database and these properties with a DB set uh, binds it to a table. So it does a little bit of magic underneath um, to take a table uh, and maps it right now. As you can see, table one object is mapped to a table in our database called table one. 
uh, as well as if you look at the ID and data in our objects, they're exactly the same. In some instances, you may not have these exact naming and we'll go over how to overcome that with attributes. So that's uh, in a nutshell how uh, what Entity Framework is. Uh, and right now, what you saw was basically uh, getting uh, a list of everything that's in the database. That's almost like saying select star from the database. So how would you do the other type of queries uh, within um, this uh, object using link, basically? So if we come over here and let's say um, we want to do a quick update, um, but the first thing we need to do is to get actually our data. And to do that, um, we'll go ahead and um, get a, a variable. So let's comment this out and create our table one. And then the next thing we want to do is we're going to say uh, db context dot table one. And then here uh, we would say um, where. And the where would be uh, the what we're looking for in this, right? So I'm just going to use x uh, and into uh, x dot um, id, uh, where id equals to let's say uh, one. So we're going to say equal equal rather than equal because this is assigning uh, uh, the object, uh, and we're just comparing. So once we did the equal equal, um, if you look at the where clause, it's going to be returning you a iQueryable um, table. So what we need to do is because we want only one object, we're going to say first or default. If you say first, um, then it returns the first element in the sequence. Uh, but if the um, value is null, I believe you get an exception. So we're just going to say uh, first or default. So uh, it will get the first one. If not, then it will get whatever the default object that, that is. Um, and so now if we look at what we're returning, uh, we are returning just a table. So now that we have our table, what we need to do is go ahead and take our data property, and we're going to now assign it a new value and let's just say something new. So this updates our um, field, but now how do we go and save these changes? So to save this, we're going to just go back to our DB context and we're just going to say save changes. So let's go ahead and put a breakpoint here and let's put another breakpoint uh, in here. Let's go ahead and run our program. So let's go ahead and also look at the data, show table data. So as you can see, the ID of one has only something. And if we go to our program, uh, this should retrieve that data for us. So now we have the data. And if we expand this, uh, notice that we have our data. And now we're going to update the value. And if we go back to our um, database, notice that nothing's been updated. And the reason is because we haven't changed anything. So once we say save changes, it takes the updated uh, values and it will persist them to the database. So now it should be updated. And if we go and refresh, we have our updated uh, value. So we did a couple of things in here. First, we used a uh, where clause, almost like we would in SQL, to tell it that we are looking for uh, ID of uh, equal one. And then we populated the field to something new um, and then saved the changes. Let's go ahead and actually comment this out and show you how you can actually add a new value into your database. So we'll go for var table one again and equals to table one. 
and now we're going to say ID is um, equal to let's say 3 and we're gonna say data is equal to and then now how do we add this uh, well we will add this by going to our DB context uh, using the add method and then passing our table one and then once we're done we're gonna go ahead and do DB context dot uh, save changes and this should add our new record so if we go to our table um, we have our two records after this program is executed we should see our third changes um, well we have something else um, let's actually say something else too and let's go ahead and execute our program okay and then that uh, executed and let's go over to our database table and refresh it and we now have a third record in there so let's take a look at something a little bit more complex uh, let's go ahead and comment this out and what we're going to do basically is do a group by um, so what we want to do is we want to go to our table and we want to group the data so therefore we have something new and then something else uh, will be grouped uh, so that we should have a count of two but the rest of them should be a count of one so that's basically what we want to do is get that uh, data out um, through our program so just as before let's go ahead and create a table one uh, variable and go to our db context um, and table one and then from here uh, we're going to do a group by and the group by um, we are going to um, ask for the data and then uh, now that we grouped it we're going to ask for the return result and that one is going to be a select statement so we're just going to do select and then now in the select let's go ahead and um, say that um, this is going to return a, a new object and that new object is going to have our data and data is going to be s dot key uh, and then it's going to be um, our data and then uh, we also need the count uh, and the count is going to be equals to s dot key dot count and one thing else we can do is actually um, because it's getting pretty long um, we can go ahead and um, break this up a little bit so uh, we're getting an error because I made a mistake here uh, so when we're getting our um, uh, we, we want to group uh, our object uh, we need to actually do a new um, and then pass the X data and that should uh, account for the error we had here uh, for having the data value uh, and then uh, what we're going to do is also um, look at see why the count is getting an error um, oh uh, because that's not part of the key uh, because the, there's there's no value and it's just going to be a count okay so there we go uh, we have that and now what we're going to do is um, do a quick for each group and this is going to be our table one and then we're going to do a console.write and this is going to be that data uh, let's actually do this the string interpolation this is going to be our count here we go so let's go ahead and run this and see what the results going to be uh, it should be as expected we should have three records um, two of them will be one and one of them will have two because of the grouping that we asked for and there you go so we have two records that are grouped uh, in here and then we have the other uh, records inside of this 
So here we went over quite a bit of data. Um, we actually went and talked about link, but we didn't really explain what link is. Um, and then inside of the link, we have these uh, expressions uh, and didn't really explain what these are. So if you're new to C-sharp and um, you're not aware of uh, link, uh, let's quickly do a review of link so that all of this uh, will make sense to you and everything else that we did uh, up above here as well. All right, so let's review link. So link is a whole new topic and we will go over just the basics here so that you can understand what we just did. Link or language integrated query allows you to query in-memory data. And you saw us doing some other stuff uh, up here with that. So link helps querying uh, collections uh, like list or maybe dictionary, but it can be used for much more than that. And you've seen this uh, using, for example, databases. You could use querying XML uh, and other types of data, maybe like file system or something. But um, to understand link, uh, let's actually go over something that we can do uh, without link and then see how link can help us uh, make things a little bit easier and more uniform across the board, whether you're querying a database or an XML file or uh, some collection. So let's go ahead and create a, um, uh, a variable uh, called sequence uh, and let's uh, make this into uh, int array. And let's initialize this array. Now, what things could we do with this? Let's say uh, that we wanted to have uh, odd versus even numbers from this list, right? Um, the way to, to do this, we would have to then create a for loop. And um, we would have to iterate through the sequence, the sequence array and then figure out um, what actually is an odd number. So we would have to then um, take the sequence, um, the current sequence uh, within that, and then we would have to figure out how to, uh, if this is odd or even. So we'll just go ahead and do a quick mod on this. Um, and then if it equals to one, then it will be an odd and we can then do a console.write line. There we go. So now if you run this, we should see um, just the numbers that are evaluated in our inside our F, F condition. So we got one, three, five, seven, and nine. So we got all the odd numbers. Now let's take a look at uh, how you would do this using link. So let's go ahead and comment our for loop. So now we're going to do the same thing, um, except here uh, what we want to do is create a, a variable. Um, so we will call it sequence of odd numbers. And let's actually now take our sequence uh, variable and then say um, where. Um, we'll do mod one on this one, and then we're gonna do a select, and that select is going to be so. Now we have a expression here that basically says so. We we're, we're saying sequence, which is an uh, a an array. And then we're saying where the numbers uh, inside of this sequence. And then we do the valuation if it's a odd or even. And then we're saying uh, once this evaluation uh, of the where happens, then we want to select that um, result. And that is then stuffed into our variable here. So now if we do a for each on this one, and then do a console at right line on the items, and let's run this, we should produce the same result. 
and we do. Now let's do one quick more example. Um, let's say now you wanted to um, go through uh, the list of the uh, sequence uh, and in the sequence you wanted to order them a different way from uh, descending rather than ascending, right? Um, to do that, then you would iterate through as well, and then you would um, uh, replace the, uh, you know, you, you would reverse this basically um, if, you, if, if you could. But then what if the numbers were not in the correct ordering and stuff? So then you would have to write a function that would go through and order this for us uh, in the descending order. Then you could do console dot right line on it. So, um, Let's just grab our variable and let's call this one descending numbers. So we would then, um, instead of the where, now we can then say order by descending. Uh, and in here, uh, instead of just doing this expression, we just tell it like for every number within the sequence, um, just do this, the ordering for that. And then we would then do a select uh, off of that. So now if we take this and put it here, and then we go ahead and iterate through this. So we should now get our list. And now it's gone in descending order. So it makes it much more simpler um, doing it this way. Now, this is not the only way to use link. You can actually use link um, using very much like uh, T-SQL, for example. Use this example to uh, query our values uh, in a different way. And how would you do this? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to actually declare our variable. And then uh, we're going to say um, from, and then we're going to have a, a value here. So it's going to be n sequence. So here, basically, what we did was we said um, from the n numbers in sequence, and then we can say uh, where the n is going to have our expression of mod 2 equals to 1 and then we're going to say select n. So this is another way of using link uh, so that it's very much more like T-SQL. So now if we run this it should produce the same exact result. There we go. So this was a very quick um, crash course uh, on link to give you a little familiarity. Um, so you get to see um, how and why you would want to use link, hopefully. Uh, this made it a little bit clear. Uh, one thing here uh, is that we were able to use all of these keywords and stuff without having to um, have any type of uh, using statement for link or other, uh, for example, this console uh, having using system and stuff. Uh, because we're using the .NET 6, um, things have changed a little bit. So if we go to our project, um, notice here that we have uh, this thing called implicit using uh, enabled. And what this means is that in our um, program, we don't have to uh, have these uh, explicit using statements. Um, the project will have this for us. Now, if we go to our object um, folder debug, because we're using a debug build, and then .NET 6, because that's what we're targeting. Uh, and inside of this, we should have a um, global usings. And this is where uh, all of our global using statements are. Uh, so this is what the system uses when uh, during the build and as well as within Visual Studio to make sure those namespaces are uh, set up correctly. If you wanted to come in here, so for example, we, um, if we go in, for example, to the database context and notice we have actually a using statement for the uh, EF framework and if you didn't want to have this and be make it to be part of global 
then what you could do is go back to the project uh, and then in here we would basically add a uh, reference to that so we would start off with by saying um, using uh, and then say include uh, and then inside of this we would have our namespace so let's go here and copy that let's comment this and then go back to our project and let's save that now we need to also end the tag so that it's uh, done correctly so we need to probably reload the project there we go because we made changes to the project file itself and notice that now we don't have any errors um, we can even build without having an issue so I just wanted to clarify that so that it didn't look like it was something magical that was happening um, you can actually go there and make this something global so you don't have to worry about those things so okay so this is uh, pretty much how link was uh, how link is working for us and the different ways of uh, using link whether it be with this dotted notation or using it very much like a T-SQL like uh, statement so by now you probably have questions about the uh, link values or excuse me the link methods uh, that we use here the where the select the order descending and and such um, now before we go into that we're also going to talk about these um, other um, parameters that were passed into these methods um, and if you're following the training sessions that we've been providing uh, we haven't really gone over these uh, so we're going to take this one step at a time and kind of explain how an array uh, is able to get this where clause and this select and then go over um, these uh, values that are being passed into it and how they're actually uh, able to work. So let's go ahead and quickly um, view our object uh, browser and what we're going to do is we're going to quickly search for the array and once we found the um, array um, and so now we have our system array and if you go here uh, notice that we don't have um, a where clause or excuse me a where method or a select uh, here at all but if we were to go to um, the link um, so if we go back here and scroll down and find system.link there we go and we have this uh, enumerable class and then if we go inside of this uh, we should have um, everything that we were doing uh, is available in these methods um, so for example um, we should have our where um, when we have the where here um, and then if we go up we have order by descending and if you scroll back down you should have your um, select here as well So we have our select here and you have a bunch of other uh, methods in here as well um, and so how is it then that the um, C sharp code uh, is able to have this dotted notation for us uh, now we kind of went over how the namespacing uh, was working for this uh, project uh, where we had actually the um, global uh, if we go back to our project here and the compile and then we had in here um, we have system.link um, uh, referenced globally uh, what we're going to do is actually remove this uh, instead of removing this because this is auto generated we're not going to remove that uh, what we will do is we will go to the uh, project so let's go scroll back up go back to our project and we're going to go ahead and put a uh, declaration here and go back to the using and this time we're going to uh, use the remove and we're going to remove the link so now that we've removed that um, let's go back to our program um, and you'll notice now that we have an error and it's requiring system.link namespace in order for this to work if we were to now uh, uncommon these lines of code it would have the same the same error in there so that's why this is working because of the link namespace let's go back into our project 
And let's go ahead and remove this again. And save that. So then now that we have our where method, uh, how would you create your own um, so that you can have something in here? So let's say you wanted to create your own method and it would have some function that you could apply on a array or to a string or something like that. Um, and you would do that by uh, creating a method. Um, let's go ahead and create a um, method called it returns a string and we'll call this uh, XYZ something so that it's not used and we're going to have a string and so this is complaining because this is not inside of a uh, class and so let's go ahead and create a class here um, we'll go ahead and and then put our method inside of this. And all this is going to do is going to return a string called, well, it's, we're going to have a XYZ string being passed back. Um, and the, this is a very simple uh, way of showing that, you know, you wouldn't want to do this in, um, in your code, but this is just to illustrate um, how you can associate um, uh, what these are called extension methods into um, other objects that will look like um, this code actually exists within that class. So in order for a string uh, to be able to see our method, uh, we would need to go do some modification to it. So the class where we have the method XYZ and we have the parameter string text as a string being passed, we need to add the this keyword in there. Um, this will make an extension method, but we also need to go to our class and make it static. Um, we also need to make the method to be static as well. So let's go ahead and take care of that now. And once we did that, everything should now work with a string value. So now if we were to test this uh, by creating a variable um, let's call this test and let's say we have ABC and now if we take test and say uh, dot and we look for XYZ uh, notice now we have our XYZ method in there now the reason this XYZ method works and the way the compiler finds this is that this class actually exists within our project and having uh, the efbench uh, namespace so it's uh, important to make sure that if you have this outside of a different class or a different namespace that you have the uh, the using statement for the namespace so that this uh, actually works so the compiler can actually find this now that we've gone over the magic of how these methods are associated to different objects, let's talk about the values inside of these uh, methods and what they are. Uh, this is a lambda expression. In order to really understand the lambda expressions, we have to kind of step back and look into um, some other things that we can do. Uh, and then we'll come back and uh, see how lambda expressions really work. So for the Lambda expressions, let's go ahead and use this uh, sequent array that we have uh, and see uh, some of the other things that we could do uh, and then look into how lambda expression actually work. So now let's say um, previously we had uh, something where we had the variable and then we had um, equals to and then we had the sequence dot where um, and then um, you had um, dot select um, and then inside of this um, we had we basically selected the um, integer values so we had something like this um, and what we want to do is kind of understand these um, lambda expressions that are being passed into our method uh, so we'll go ahead and keep this uh, as is and let's just uh, empty this out and then we'll come back and uh, see how this works so let's also comment this out for for now and what we can do is go ahead and create a class utility class and uh, inside of this we're just going to have one method 
And this method uh, basically is going to check to see if a number being passed is greater than 5. If it is, those are the ones we want. Uh, otherwise, drop everything else. So let's go ahead and create that method. Uh, so we'll say public. And let's make this uh, static so that uh, we don't have to instantiate the uh, class. Uh, so we can say uh, public static. Uh, and let's say return a Boolean uh, if it is um, greater uh, than 5. And it accepts, of course, an integer value. So let's just say integer value. And then inside of this, we would do the uh, checks. So we do if. Um, and if the uh, integer value is greater than 5, um, we would want to return true. And if it's not, we want to return false. So this is the method that we have. And um, let's now see how we can actually use this. So here we have our where clause. And what we're going to do is um, say utility dot is greater than 5. And this actually works in the compiler as a complaint. So let's actually see if this will um, actually iterate for us and return the values over greater than 5. So we'll just say s. And let's do a console that right line and make this item there we go and then we'll come back and see how this is actually working so let's run this and as you can see now we have all the numbers greater than five so if we look at the signature for this um, you'll notice that we have our function uh, and it's uh, accepting an int uh, and then it's returning a boolean Right. So if we go look at our signature of the method that we have, we are returning a bool and we're accepting an integer. So this method will work. Uh, what will happen is inside of the where clause, um, this function is used. So inside of this where uh, method, uh, it uses our function to pass in these um, integer values in our array to identify if it's greater than uh, 5 because that's what our method does. And then based on the results of being true or false, uh, that's what it's going to return back. And that's what we have a select statement over here for. So this is now uh, basically calling a method. And this method has a name and a signature. So this is a name method. Uh, another way you could do this, um, that's actually, because uh, this is going to be a little bit long, so let's go ahead and split this out a little bit. Uh, another way you could do this um, is using a delegate. So now if we go into um, this function, uh, notice that it's got a delegate keyword, so we can actually um, use a delegate. And we can do that by um, saying delegate. And then the parameters that we want is going to be an int. So let's actually also call this uh, integer value. Uh, and then for and then inside of this, uh, we can do our check to say if integer value is greater than five, uh, and then we're gonna return true. Otherwise, we're going to return false. And now the where clause is not complaining uh, because we are passing in a signature of a method that is going to return um, a Boolean value and accepts an integer value. So let's go ahead and run this. And as before, it's returning the correct value. Now this in C sharp is a anonymous method because it doesn't have a name. Um, it's just a signature. Now, this is exactly the same thing as what we've been doing before. So let's go ahead and delete this. And let's go ahead and just have an arbitrary uh, character. This could be uh, integer. Um, it could be integer. It could be uh, just a character. It could be anything. So I'll just use I because um, I would stand for maybe an integer. Uh, you can choose whatever uh, character or name that you want. 
and then uh, we're going to use these equal and greater than sign um, and then we're going to say um, utility dot is greater than five and now we're going to pass an i and this is exactly the same thing as we've done before um, so the remember that the sequence uh, which is an array of uh, and inherits from i innumerable uh, and it has our where method in the system dot link because this is an extension method and it has the this keyword on the int um, what it's doing is it's uh, as it iterates through uh, the 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 i is actually going to be this uh, numerical value based on where it is in the uh, loop that it's doing and then we can uh, pass that i into our method that will do the evaluation uh, for us so if we go ahead and run this it should have exactly the same result and it does so in lambda expressions the lambda operator that's equal greater than sign separates the input parameter on the left side from the lambda body on the right side so this was uh, basically a crash course on everything we did so let's go ahead and do a quick review of everything we went over so we kind of went a little bit over um, what the um, entity framework is uh, just a very crash basic crash course of just looking at the one table and getting its data and manipulating that data uh, grouping and searching and doing other things um, and then we looked at uh, link um, and then after that we looked at lambda expressions so now that we have a, a much more of a basic understanding of how all this stuff fits together and the next tutorials uh, will make this as part one and the next tutorial will go over uh, EF and much more in depth um, to figure out how to join tables how to call store procedures because you're not just bound to uh, mapping to tables uh, or anything like that so we'll go over all those other topics uh, and how it all is going to work uh, thank you again stay safe and we'll see you in the next session